call the meeting of the October 6th City Commission meeting to order. Our first thing on the agenda is invocation, and Pastor Wade Graber of First Baptist Church is nice enough to come down and help us with it. Good. Cool. Well, let's do it. All right, let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being here in the room with us, Lord. We thank you for being a God of presence, Lord, that you never leave us or forsake us. And, God, that you have made great uh, sacrifice for us and you've shown a pure and unconditional eternal love for us. Thank you for this night and for the freedom to, to share in this prayer time and to be a part of this city. And, God, I just uh, thank you for our leaders here and pray for our guidance as they uh, deliberate tonight. And, uh, Lord, just for wisdom, Lord, we live in a day when, when people are just concerned about, uh, about foolish decisions on a national level. And I pray, Lord, that we... We are thankful we don't have to make those uh, observations on a local level, God. We pray for continued guidance and wisdom and direction for our leaders for this night and the decisions and choices that need to be made. And, God, that uh, they would just be uh, ministers of yours for the good of the people, as your word says. Thank you, Lord, for each one here tonight. Uh, thank you, God, for the, the successes and the things we've been enjoying. And, uh, God, we just pray your anointing and for over this meeting and your covering tonight, Lord, Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay, it's our honor this evening to have the third grade class of Mrs. Uh, Miss Myers at Skelly Elementary is going to lead us in Pledge of Allegiance. So if they would come forward, we'd appreciate it. Hello, my name is Echo Morse, and I, what I like to do in El Dorado is go to the lake. My name is Kaden Brown, and what I like to do in El Dorado is go to the YMCA. My name is Dominic Gomez, and I like to go to the city pool. My name is Gunnar Owens, and I like to go to the park. My name is Creighton Tatt, and I like to go to the park. My name is Lila Spradlin, and I like to go to Summit Park. My name is Misty Ryan. I like to go to the park. My name is Chloe Gardner, and I like to go to the park. My name is Preston Johnson, and I love to go to school. <laughs> Whoa. My name is Samantha Beard, and I like to go to the park. My name is Cheyenne Jones, and I like to go to the El Dorado YMCA. Sounds like we need some more parks, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mrs. Myers, did you make note of that one that likes to go to school? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the next thing on the agenda is a proclamation. Uh, this is Fire Prevention Week. And I'll read this here. Whereas the city of El Dorado is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting El Dorado, and whereas fire is a serious public safety concern both locally and internationally, and homes are the locations where people are greatest risk for fire, and whereas home kills more than 2,700 people in the United States in 2013, according to the National Fire Protection Association, and fire departments in the United States respond to 369,500 home fires, and whereas working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying in reported home fires in half, and whereas three out of five home fire deaths result from fires in properties without working smoke alarms. 
whereas one-fifth of all homes with smoke alarms, none were working, whereas when smoke alarms should have operated but did not do so, it usually because batteries were missing, disconnected, or dead. And whereas Eldorado residents should install smoke alarms in every sleeping room outside each separate sleeping area and on every level of the home. And whereas Eldorado residents should install smoke alarms and alert devices that meet the needs of people who are deaf or hard of hearing, whereas Eldorado residents who have planned and sacrificed a home fire escape plan uh, are more prepared and will therefore be more likely to survive a fire. And whereas Eldorado first responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education. And whereas Eldorado residents are responsive to public education measures and are able to take personal steps to increase their safety for fire, especially in their homes. And whereas the 2014 Fire Prevention Week theme, Working Smoke Alarms Save Lives, Test yours every month effectively serves to remind us that we need working smoke alarms to give us the time to get out safely. Now, therefore, I, Michael Fagg, Mayor of the City of El Dorado, Kansas, do hereby proclaim October 5th through the 11th of 2014 as Fire Prevention Week throughout this city and urge all the people of El Dorado to test their smoke alarms at least every month by pushing the test button and to support the many public safety activities and efforts that El Dorado Fire Emergency Services during Fire Prevention Week 2014. In witness thereof, I hereunto set my hand and cause the seal of the City of El Dorado to be affixed this sixth day of October 2014. Fire Chief, would you like to say anything at this point? <coughs> Uh, for, for starters, we, uh, Tawanda, Augusta, Butler EMS, and uh, assisted us. Just, we're actually, I think we still have units on the scene of Southwest 50th. We had a major uh, house fire. Um, so uh, that occupant did not have insurance. So uh, contact the Red Cross, anybody, if you'd like to assist with their, with their uh, recovery. And uh, it, it just highlights the, the need for fire prevention. We, uh, we haven't got a cause determination on the fire yet, but extensive damage to the two-story home that they that they uh, worked on. Uh, there's there's many things. Uh, smoke detectors are are is the highlight, but there's many things that we need to be uh, careful of in uh, in preventing fires. One thing with little children, uh, you can get this at uh, one of the local stores here in town. Looks like a toy, but it's but it's not. It's a uh, see, I can't even. I'm not even smart enough to light it. It's a lighter. But it, it certainly uh, catches little children's attention and uh, very dangerous. So um, we'll have uh, a little bit of highlight of what we have going on this week. We have, uh, we'll be doing school assemblies. We started today at Oil Hill. We'll be doing school assemblies at every school in town. We'll be doing uh, daycare visits and uh, promoting fire safety all week long. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Okay, personal appearance. Uh, first on the list this evening is Kurt Bookout, Public Utilities Director. I want to thank the Commission for giving me this opportunity to talk about a couple of things that we're very proud of. Uh, first, um, for the fourth year in a row, and I'll qualify that statement, I guess. Uh, the Kansas Water Environment Association, so it's the professional organization that uh, for wastewater treatment plants, um, each year they choose a treatment plant and it goes through, a, there's an audit process where there are plants that are nominated and they go by and they audit the plant, do a full day audit of all the procedures, safety, all those things. It's basically about how the operators, the, the guys that run the plant, the job that they do. Not so much about the treatment plan itself, but the job that they do with what they have. And um, this year, actually it, the award was for last year, but we received the, the award this year at the uh, annual conference, uh, received the award for the fourth time in five years. Uh, they require you to sit out 
you can only win it two years in a row. And so then you have to sit out a year. So I guess so one facility doesn't dominate the category, but we've, we've done that and we're very proud of the guys that operate that plant and uh, the, the top plant in the state for four out of the last five years. And because we've won, won the award in 2012 and 2013, we'll have to sit out this next year. Uh, the other exciting thing that happened at the annual conference uh, about a month ago, the Kansas section of the American Water Works Association, so the professional organization, organization for water, each year they choose one person, one operator typically, um, to recognize in the state of Kansas that really um, epitomizes what what the professionals in the water business are about. And, uh, and we were very happy that this year our own Robert Simmons uh, received that award and uh, went to Topeka to accept the award. I want to read real quick uh, part of, part of uh, the, uh, the nomination. Um, the level of dedication and professionalism Robert Simmons puts into his career is difficult to describe. Bob is the epitome of what every water treatment plant is looking for, an intelligent, dedicated professional that truly loves what he's doing. And Bob has spent quite a bit of time perfecting his craft. He started at the El Dorado water treatment plant 42 years ago and quickly rose through the ranks as a man who can get things done and find a solution to every problem that arises. Um, I'm not going to talk about all the things that he's done. I, we don't have that much time. Uh, but I do also want to say that Bob's role in training new operators cannot be overemphasized. Uh, we have three fairly new operators, and he's got a lot of knowledge that he's been passing on to them. Um, Bob was also responsible for running weekly analysis for our wetlands pilot uh, that we did about 10 years ago. And after three years of testing, proved the reliability of Kansas wetlands for treating municipal wastewater on a larger scale. The implementation of this discovery led to the to El Dorado's award of the, uh, the APWA, which is American Public Works Association National Environmental Project of the Year Award in 2008. And so not only has he worked in water treatment, but he's kind of cross-trained in wastewater. Uh, Bob is married to Maris, and Maris is here tonight. He's active in his church. He enjoys um, hiking, rock climbing, devotes much of his time uh, uh, to youth in his church through a scout group called Royal Rangers. And Bob also does uh, prison ministries out at the El Dorado Correctional Facility. So uh, we're very proud to have him as, as one of our operators and, and uh, hope he sticks around. So with that, I would like to, for Bob to come up and... This is the Operator's Meritorious Service Award that he received at the conference. So there you are. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on the personal appearance, we have Linda Jolly from El Dorado Inc. Good evening, Linda Jolly with El Dorado Inc. I made notes, so maybe it won't be too long. If I just get to chatting, it could be way too long. Um, I think each month uh, departments have an opportunity to come um, and talk to you a little bit about what they have going on. Um, in economic development, I think one of our key roles is to help coordinate new and existing business recruitment. Um, and that's business expansions also. I think one of the things that we've done in the past year, or maybe a little more than a year, is to start having uh, periodic reviews of pending and prospective projects with the city engineering department. Um, Scott Rickard and his team have been very helpful in going over projects that are happening right now, things that all of us have had contacts, and it gives us a chance to uh, talk about opportunities and sometimes challenges. They might be small challenges, sometimes they're large. 
uh, regarding what people are wanting to do with a particular piece of property. And so I feel like that has been really um, beneficial and I'm very thankful for the time that the engineering department has taken to help us with that. Um, this summer we've responded to two uh, requests for proposals from the Kansas Department of Commerce that were requesting large parcels, large parcels being 100 acres. Uh, oftentimes they're looking for rail accessibility and when we start to look around South Central Kansas we see that not very many communities can offer infrastructure and rail accessibility and has large parcels. So I think as time goes on we'll often see um, groups coming to us looking for uh, the properties that we have available. Uh, with the one project this summer, we did get down to the point that we were one of five uh, sites being considered. Three were in Kansas, two were in another state. Uh, we still haven't heard where they made their decision, but they didn't choose uh, to come to El Dorado and the other projects pending right now. Um, with that said, we are working with one of our uh, new property owners that has acquired 440 acres that could be industrial uh, property, could have access to BN and uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe and the UP rail, as well as uh, is close enough to our community to have water and sewer um, infrastructure extensions. So we'll continue to do that. Um, recently, we coordinated or helped coordinate a meeting with the financial advisor for the city, Herb, the finance director, and myself met with two of our prospects about local incentives. Um, at this time, both projects were out for bid. Uh, I think at this time, it's been two or three weeks, they do have their first or initial bids in. Looks like one of them is continuing to move forward and the other is uh, looking for a second set of bid numbers. And then we have two additional prospects. One is a redevelopment. And of those first two, one's a new project. The other is an expansion. And we do have a, a large redevelopment project uh, that we've been talking to. And then a fourth project that is an upper story housing project. And we hope to have both of those uh, individuals meet with uh, us in the near future. There are different ways that we work with projects and it isn't really all about incentives. It's not always about local incentives. Uh, we recently helped uh, the city, Kansas Gas Service and a company called Spire host a lunch and learn uh, regarding companies that might have interest in uh, future use of CNG for their fleets. Uh, we will continue to work with Spire, who becomes the prospect to us uh, for the potential of creating a public or maybe a fleet ready site uh, within our community. Sometimes people come to us and they just ask us to identify either buildings or property. They really don't want anything else besides that. Um, we do hear from contacts that come to us helping us, wanting us to help them resolve challenges. And again, those challenges aren't just challenges that would be with the city. It could be with the property. It could be with utility companies. And it's our job to get them in contact with the right people and try to get answers that will work for them. We also often coordinate with lenders, look for gap financing uh, for potential businesses. Uh, we have a group that we're working with right now and we have uh, identified incentives for them, but they're all state related incentives. So we've coordinated with the Kansas Department of Commerce. If that project decides to move forward, I would uh, anticipate that we would host a job fair on their behalf. They're going to need to hire a number of employees quickly, and I think it'll take a job fair to be able to do that. Um, we had a project that seemed to originate here. It um, actually was a project that was going to benefit members throughout the Butler County community. In that particular instance, we would work to find the right resources for them and the people for them to meet with with other groups with the county and so forth uh, to get information. And we hope that project moves forward with a feasibility study. Uh, sometimes it's environmental issues. We have a project right now that has some environmental issues. They've looked to the city for some incentives. And then uh, we've made and had initial contact with the um, 
company that hopes to expand about incentives on the state level. Um, sometimes it's just redevelopment of existing property. So there's many things that come into play. Sometimes we spend a little time, sometimes we spend a lot of time. So, um, Target marketing is one of the things we've talked about and I didn't bring a very good example because I didn't proofread it, but we're starting to create in conjunction with information that we're putting on the Civic Plus site some flyers for all of the property that we have available. The problem with the flyer is the information on the first page isn't right. Um, we've always used flyers for information, especially if we had a specific type of business. Um, the business office park is a good example. A few years ago we were looking for a certain type of uh, project to go into the park. We created a flyer. We sent it out to potential uh, companies. One of the things that is new is our opportunity to post commercial properties in detail um, on the Civic Plus real estate locator. We're starting to work with that module in the site. We do have the available properties in the business office park, but we will be continuing to add additional properties. Uh, these flyers will be attachments. We're working with Main Street to post their downtown rentals and we're focusing right now on the commercial side of that uh, module. Um, you know, we often have leads. We look and qualify those leads. A lot of people have dreams and ideas, but it's good to get them adequate information up front about what they need to do, um, that you do need a down payment if you're going to start a project in most cases. Um, Talk to them about zoning and proper use of property and what utility extensions and things like that cost. Um, we've had a visitation program for some time um, with our larger businesses in the community and this year as a result of some of our uh, conversations during the budget process, we have started to host some informal coffees and lunches. Uh, we've done that eight times since I think about May. Uh, we've invited well over 80 businesses to come to the table and talk to us about their uh, business. Gives us the opportunity to say if you're thinking of expanding your business or if you're having challenges, you know, let us know. Maybe we can help you. Our attendance hasn't been as high as we'd hoped, but um, we are continuing to work on that. An example of another follow-up that we've done recently and that we would do is a company we worked with for quite some time and there was potential or the um, information that said they might have uh, safety issue prob problems. And uh, with the help of the El Dorado Fire Department, we went out and had a nice visit with them and determined that they were aware of the issues that they had and were starting to take care of them. So. Um, we do have some incentive information available at this time on the Civic Plus site under doing business. Uh, the next section of things and that we work with with El Dorado Inc. is communication and marketing. Uh, we will continue our um, 360 website at least till the end of uh, 2015. Uh, waiting to see what the available information on businesses in the community will be uh, once the chamber gets their site up. Uh, we've had about 786,000 page views year to date on the 360 site. Available rentals, this is on the residential side, has seen about 32,000 visitors, a little over 32,000. Job postings about 172,000 year to date. Um, We've created the relocation guide and we'll maintain that for the Civic Plus uh, side and we have, uh, we've, we're working and continuing to work on our pages under doing business in conjunction with uh, the engineering department on the Civic Plus. We continue to do Facebook and other social media. Um, one of the projects that we launched November of last year was a, 
um, blog to inform, educate, promote good things in the El Dorado community. It's called SNAP, and we've had about 72 features on that. Uh, the award for Bob would be a good human interest uh, piece to, to see there. And it's kind of for outsiders to see the good things that are happening in El Dorado, as well as our own public, because sometimes you get someplace and you just don't remain aware of the good things that are happening. Um, we've hosted some educational opportunities this year. We um, had a session on tax information. We recently co-hosted an event with Susan B. Allen on uh, health care. We had a job fair in April. On the real estate related front, we had a commercial open house in April, a residential open house in July. We do help oversee the ad hoc housing committee. We work with the city on the NRP program. We do post and work with our landlords on available rentals. Um, recently, we've been coordinating information with builders and developers, hoping to spur some additional new housing development, uh, providing them with the NRP information as well as spec housing. And um, we commonly coordinate with local realtors on commercial properties that are available. Maybe a new listing they have, um, they have questions about it, where's the best place to find a potential prospect and so forth. Um, networking socials recently, the Gravity Works, um, new name reveal, and uh, helped with the Energy Services open house last week. We did work <coughs> with Representative Pompeo, who requested tours of Holly Frontier, Susan B. Allen, BG Products. Um, we will be working with the Chamber in Main Street to help coordinate the Women's Fair this coming year. Uh, WSU Outlook Conference is this week. I do serve on the Wichita Area Outlook team uh, in conjunction with that. Uh, Kansas Economic Development Association, and we have interaction with the uh, Governor's One Shot Turkey Hunt. Um, I think El Dorado often does take a leadership role in some of the programs, um, oversight of the ad hoc housing committee and the spec housing program. Uh, we do provide grant and budget information as requested by other departments. And uh, we've represented the city and actually Butler County at the Brookings study on exports that's taken place in the region this year. Their final report will be out in a few weeks. Um, and with that, I'd be open to any questions you may have. Anything with the old mill school? Um, the school district itself does have a request for proposals out at this time. We did forward that on to some contacts we had, but we're not directly involved in that recruitment piece. How about the old Ford dealership? Is there any talk of anything out that way? We are working with I'm a prospect that. on that. Okay. And Mayor, it seemed to me like Sue said that November is maybe the opening date of the RFPs for the middle school. Okay. If I remember right. Their last uh, prospect, we worked extensively with them and provided information mm -hmm. uh, for their second round application. They prepared their first round application and didn't come to us. So. I uh, wanted to show you we're going to have a few ads coming up, and uh, the theme of those ads are going to be people make El Dorado great, get to know our people. And it just points them to the snap uh, for stories. Linda, I'm sure that, that nap is a neat deal. Very positive, oh, and whoever puts you. that together does a good job with that. It takes time. We didn't realize it would be quite so time consuming. Yeah. We have found people like the human interest side of the story. So Bob gets the award today and they're happy about that, but they'd really like to know about him rock climbing or the other things that he does. So. Yeah, I'll second that. I've heard a lot of good things about the snaps and I've enjoyed reading them. I think that's yeah. a really neat deal. If you have ideas for those, please forward them to us. The ideas are as hard sometimes as writing the information or gathering it. 
Do we have a list of businesses that we would like to have in El Dorado that's been updated? You know, where you sit down and if you had a wish list, here's the 10 areas that we'd be interested in. Um, Inc. did some work uh, about 18 months ago to identify target sectors. Yeah. Uh, we have done that. I know that in talking with Main Street, um, they're working. First step, we were going to get properties on the uh, Civic Plus site, and that's one of their goals is to uh, look at target businesses that should fill their vacancies in the downtown, and we will help them as they move forward with that. A lot of our target surrounds industry. It, uh, you know, although we definitely would be interested in more companies like uh, Power Grid Engineering, uh, they don't come along all the time. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is sometimes you or others talk to me about, hey, I know this company and I think they'd be a good fit for El Dorado. And I might tell you, and I've said this, I can't contact those companies directly and keep them eligible for state benefits. If they actually are wanting to make a move, they need to make the contact with us first if they're an in-state company. Now, if it's somebody from outside the borders of Kansas, that's different, but within the state. So when you have someone and they talk to you about it, be sure that you ask them to make that first call in to us, to Scott or to I, because then we can make notification and they will be eligible if they make a decision to make the move. Has there ever been any discussion, Linda? Let's say that you landed a couple of those big ones you was talking about, <clears throat> where it would affect the existing businesses in town. You know, those those employees got to come from somewhere. Yep. And, you know, I think I might have told you my McPherson story about them not bidding on the airplane deal that went to Independence. I was having lunch with one of those guys one day, and they said we didn't bid on it, and they said why? And the, and the theory was that we didn't want to interfere with our mix in our community, that if they come to town, that that would affect our existing industry. And I, I could never get that out of my mind, that part of it. Of, you know, if you got 200 that come to town and they're paying good wages, that's going to affect some existing businesses that we have. Um, you know, there's often times when we talk about things, and I know uh, Herb and I have some of those conversations occasionally. There are times we haven't submitted responses to proposals um, based on different reasons. Could be employment base, um, but um, the I mean, I may let me butt in a little bit. Um, the the scope of incentives is based on pay. So I guess for your example, if it was 200 jobs that paid 25 an hour, we're trying to get them because I guess in my mind, we've, we want everyone in El Dorado to make as much money as humanly possible. And I think it's driven by what we call capitalism. Um, one of the companies that we're talking about that we think we have a good shot at getting, they're going to absolutely, they're coming here because of that set of skilled employees they need that are here. They understand that to get them, they're going to have to pay a better wage. And so they're going to pay a better wage. So I think um, short, of the, short of the commission telling us we don't want competition. The, the wages of everyone in El Dorado, that's what I'm focused on. I want everyone to make $25 an hour. That's what I want. Um, because if everyone makes $25 an hour, Tony sells more cars, McDonald's sells more hamburgers, Walmart sells more jeans, everyone else I mean, and I didn't invent this, Henry Ford invented it, I guess, or is famous for the quotation that the best thing for people that sell, so a consuming type economy, is for everybody to make as much money as humanly possible. So that's 
That's how I look at anything that comes. And so if you want to come, and an example, so if you want to come to El Dorado and pay minimum wage, we're going to be supportive, but we're probably, well, you won't get the ground for free. You'll pay full price for any ground that the city has. Um, you won't get, you won't get the incentives. You get a hug, but we're not going to incent something that pays so little that then it, it costs the rest of us all to chip in every year to pay their health insurance or to pay those other expenses that minimum wage doesn't get a family afford to. So we want to, we want the, the most money we can get for the employees of the city of El Rado. So, so the standards that, that uh, I guess the MO that you're operating under here is that the businesses that you're actively recruiting are those that are going to pay better. You know, we, we've talked about this in the past. You know, you've mm -hmm. got some. I mean, it's uh, 15 an hour in full medical. Right. So that's our, our gold threshold. standard. That's the threshold that you that's don't go right. below. That's the threshold for the big work. Um, also, when you look at some of these projects, it's very obvious that the recruitment won't come just from here. The one that's pending right now needs so many employees. They want, you had to meet a criteria to have so many employees in a 25-mile radius, so many individuals in a 25-mile radius. And frankly, um, I would say that El Dorado was uh, one of maybe two sites in all of South Central Kansas that could apply for that project. And it could be critical to the region. So we, we are applying for those types of projects. And I think that that only consider us right. because of the air, airline, the aircraft manufacturing skilled labor force that is unemployed today. And so, um, a, um, a business won't come to an area if they don't have employees. I mean, step one, is the, the first question we get is, tell me about your unemployment rate. Tell me, and if it's skilled labor they want, tell me about number of machinists. Do you got machinists there? How many? Um, what do they make? Um, the, the cost of the piece of ground is usually not a material decision because it doesn't, it's not significant in the big picture. I think, what was, how many billion was this, that one project? $148 million dollar capital investment. Well, we had the one that was over a billion. What was that? And so if you're spending a billion dollars, if, you, if your ground is 100,000, it's not a significant number. You're spending a billion dollars and there are no machinists to make whatever it is you want to make, you're not coming. Because it would be a pretty building and you'll fail. And so in my work, I've only seen that mistake made once. And that's why it's crucial for us to provide them with information on their decision making. They look for three reoccurring cost factors. Actually, once they're over the initial negotiation for ground and infrastructure, what they're really interested in is amount of labor, cost of labor, uh, transportation costs if they have a product or a commodity that needs to come in or out. And the third thing that they look at is their cost of utilities and the availability of those utilities to them. Those really become the three more important factors uh, once they make a selection to a site. And it's critical that they be able to get that labor. And that's why this last project said we aren't going to talk to anyone that doesn't have this many people in 25-mile radius. And that really, that really eliminated a lot of places, because that means you had to be near a metro area. But they didn't want to be particularly in the metro, because there was another factor that kept them out of the metros. <laughs> so it's a game when it comes to that. But we just keep putting best foot forward. And uh, I always believe that you work with projects and you hope they come because it's the right thing, and we don't manipulate anything. Um, 
or give them mis misinformation so that they don't make that right decision because it doesn't do us any good. If they come and they establish and they create the jobs and they can't make it, it's not any good for us. So we have to be careful about giving them proper information up front. And I think that's, I think that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And you, um, and then you got to make sure though it is fair. I, I know a city gave a chip manufacturer free wastewater treatment. Well, wastewater's full of stuff when you make Fritos or potato chips. And so it's hard to treat and it's expensive to treat. And so this city said, if you come to our city, and they were really good jobs, we'll give you wastewater treatment. Well, how do you tell all your other existing manufacturers that you got to pay, you've been here a hundred years, but you got to pay, but the new guy gets free wastewater. And so when, uh, when I bid the project, gave them a great deal, but the town that got it gave it to them. Well, you know, that was their elected officials' decision. If that made sense to them, it, it didn't make sense to me. And you really can't. You can't start making those concessions for one unless you're willing to change that across the board. Right. So you'll see communities even today, I mean, probably in the area we have the most water of anyone. You see other communities saying they're going to give water away. We could, but if you start it, where do you stop that kind of thing? So, and, you know, we make them comply with our wastewater standards, and we should tell them what those are up front. But I think we work hard to make it as seamless as possible. And so a developer coming to El Dorado, um, especially any of any major scope, just has Scott as a point of contact. They often don't know what doors they all have to knock on. In a bigger city, you know, you may have 10 different locations at City Hall to permit a project. In El Dorado, it's all funneled through one person in it. And, and developers like that because they don't start building and then get stopped by some Govern some piece of the government that they didn't know they had to get permitted. And that's a problem. Other questions? Thank you, Wanda. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, that's all the personal appearance. We're ready for agenda item number one, which is public comments. And this is a time that a person can come forward, state their name and address, and they got five minutes to talk to us about whatever they'd like to talk about. James Powell, 323 West Car. Um, as I was sitting here listening to this, things started going through my mind. Um, first off, I, I want to ask uh, about the city website. I think it's a beautiful website, uh, but I was wondering when we're going to get updated videos. Uh, the last video was August 9th. Kind of hard to keep up on the times if we can't go back and review those. Um, the second thing I was just thinking about and- Are you talking about the commission meetings? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. We're having some trouble. Um, it's related to the equipment we have in the back room, not the website, and so we're working on that as soon as we get it up. We'll okay. Have that fixed. Outstanding. Outstanding. And maybe even a little more on that because people wonder. Um, the uh, equipment was put in when the building was remodeled, 04. And so, as you know, 10 years with technology is cr cr crazy long. And so, um, we're looking at what we need to do and how we need to do it right now so we recognize the problem. Okay, outstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, my second thought is I, I was listening to uh, Miss Jolly and 
uh, Mr. Llewellyn speak, you know, he brought up the point that, you know, we, we have to be fair across the board, but as I look at El Dorado, we're really not being fair. Uh, you know, the existing businesses that have been here a long time aren't getting the same breaks that the big guys are getting. You know, we, we really need to reevaluate that. If, if we want to re, reinvigorate our downtown and our Main Street, we have to offer these same incentives. You know, a 10-year tax break to someone out in the industrial park really doesn't mean as much to that little guy who, I mean, he is counting his pennies to pay his employees. They can use the same amount of help. We've lost several businesses downtown. You know, I grew up here. I can remember when we had a vibrant downtown with men's clothing, with, you know, LaForge's sold everybody their supplies. And, you know, everybody got everything in our downtown, but now we don't have that. Uh, just today I was asking my father, who moved his business out of town because of these very issues. You know, I said, what would it take to get you back into El Dorado? He said, you know, if we had the services in our downtown, I would be willing to pay more to go buy them there. If we had the city willing to work with the existing businesses to help them instead of giving all the tax breaks to the big guys, help the little guy. The little guy is what supports our economy. They're the ones that employ 85% of the United States, not the big guy. The big guy pays good wages, yes, but we need the support industries. That's what we need here in El Dorado. If you want to see a boom, a vibrant boom, we have to have that back. We can blame Walmart all we want. It's not Walmart. I guarantee you that. Our, our downtown went down after the 79 flood. I lived here. I lived through it. I watched it die. We, we need to do something. That's all I've got. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank, Thank you, Jim. Well, I want to say good evening and thank you for letting me come again to knock on your door. I'm Ginger Hurst. I live at 720 West Ash, and my husband and I have lived here for 17, 18 years, I believe it is now. And in light of what Pastor Graber said, um, I just have a few, like three points to make, and then I'll give you the floor back. But in light of what Pastor Graber alluded to tonight, um, I don't think there's been a time in our history as a nation that there's been as much fear and concern and anxiety regarding possible um, what the future holds regarding terrorists on our own soil. And adding to that would be uh, diseases that um, have crossed borders and um, there's just a lot of concern among um, people now. And so I don't think there's a better time to offer this city an opportunity to find a safe haven. And so again, I would present to you the idea that a chapel, a 24-hour house of prayer, um, would be an asset to this community. Um, I certainly respect this board's decision, but I humbly ask that you would reconsider um, there was some discussion last time about 10 acres, and that would be um, fabulous. Um, and, and I'm talking about just west of the new fire station. And so I would like to um, bring this to your attention again, um, because I think that the times are changing. It is not the same United States, the same small town USA America that it used to be. And I'm, I believe that um, people are going to need to find solace and help in times of need. And I believe that offering a place that is open 24 hours, no denomination connected with it, would help in this matter. So thank you for my time here. Would you have any questions of me? Was, were you familiar with the prayer, I don't know what they called it officially, it was downtown for a while? Yes, I um, do know they have. Was that 24 hours at one point? Um, I wasn't a part of that, and okay. it could have been, um, but but I, I don't have that information. Okay. So I, do, I really don't it know was. to answer honestly. Would something existing, would an existing structure of some sort, I mean, are you guys interested in that? Or are you guys 
pretty interested in just building and um, the the picture that uh -huh. we have in mind is a stone chapel sort of an English Tudor okay. style and um, so a new nice facility and, it would be a very nice facility okay yes. I just said no yes I remember that was down there I wasn't sure if right. you were familiar with it or right that's all okay. thanks <clears throat> that, that location is that so you can see it from the turnpike um, I think that would be an advantage um, as I mentioned the last time I was here that um, in Kansas City their house of prayer they have people coming from countries all over the world and in Arkansas is um, the stone I forget the name of that some chapel there people come from all of the nation mm -hmm. and so anything visible is going to have an advantage I believe and um, the highway I think it uh, gives us that advantage Any Anything other questions, Commissioner? I don't have any, Ginger. Thank you. Uh huh. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Herb, does the city own that kind of that triangle piece of ground when you get off Turnpike? Mm hmm. Is that big enough for something it's like flood that? Floodplain, isn't it? I'm just that the thought just hit me. You know, if we're looking, and it doesn't to have access. access yes. Yeah, no access. No access. Okay. Just a thought. I just, so we do own it. It'd be nice if we had something in there. So. Okay, is there anybody else? Okay, if not, we will close the public comment section and we will go to agenda item number two, the consent agenda. Guys, did you have anything on that? I'd like to tell the staff thank you for putting in the whole thing because I do in the, in the way that's presented it's, it helps me. I had a, some things that I had highlighted out and called Tab and she was going to check into it for me. So uh, on page seven, there was a Hubber and Associates said Interpol license. Just wondering what that was. That's the records management system license for the police department. Okay, thank you. Quality Timber Products, and it says Cedar Mulch, and I was wondering, is that a local company that we buy that from? Um, that is not. Typically, we buy our or we get our mulch from our compost site when the quality is is right and we have enough. Unfortunately, we were not able to get it from our compost site this year, and so we had to purchase it. Where's this company out of? Um, I believe they're out of Wichita, if I remember okay. the right. invoice correctly. American Food Fund Company. Um, again, we try That's to buy local when we can. That's the recreation concessions um, invoices, and we buy from Dillon and Walmart and wherever else in town we can find the things that we need. But when we need it in bulk sizes, we will tend to okay. do that. On page 13, uh, stormwater fund. There was like one, two, three, four, five concrete materials company. I just wondered where those project locations. as under stormwater. It was at Main and Locust and Locust and Gordy, and we replaced a storm okay. water pipe. Actually, yeah, storm in, sewer pipe. installed new. Installed new. No, no storm. Well, there was repair of an ancient one, and new down the alley. Yeah, that was that was a project for years and years and years, and you've seen some new development on South Main, even even. Um, Dr. Plummer's office on South Main has been there for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, Who's going to help him out then? Yeah. And, and the drainage in the area wasn't the greatest. You had old rail beds, um, which Gordy used to be, and, and six inch drainage pipes that went underneath it. Um, with the stormwater crew out of the Public Works Department, we were able to install a new pipe, divert all of that water to Main Street, and get it away from that alley. It's, and it's really helped a lot of those businesses down in that area. Okay. And wasn't even some of that old railroad type, type box culvert? Yeah, I think there was all kinds of stuff down there. But you know. mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's been coming for a long time, so thank you for that. 
<clears throat> page 16 was self-insurance reserve fund. There was like 13 items in there that was fruits and veggies. Totaled up like $622. And I think... I think that we buy, I think that uh, that's part of our wellness program, isn't it? We, we've talked about that. I, I don't know if we've talked about it since the mayor and Chase came on board, but I know we've talked about it in the past. That we allow our department heads or to designate someone in their department to go to Dillon's to purchase fruits and vegetables for their department every week. And some departments partake and some do not. Okay. <clears throat> and you weren't, Mayor, you weren't here when it started, but... We had comments like, I haven't had an apple in 20 years. And so today, if you go, we are not spending money on electricity for potato chips and junk food. We have employees eating apples and bananas and broccoli and carrots. And so... Um, that, yeah, we want to affect our bottom line, and it's been working. Page 16. Oh. Yeah, okay. I, I, uh, it just can be kind of funny. It's self-insurance reserve fund in $622. Now, yeah. that's not anything on the deal. It just hit me kind of funny. Now. Yeah. Page 38, uh, there was an inventory clearing. Tab, did you figure out what that was? Yes. Um, the city purchases fuel and vehicle parts, and all of those expenses are expensed to fund 71, and that's the one you see right there. Okay. Um, once those expenses, or once those departments use fuel or vehicle parts, then those expenses are um, debited to them and taken and out of fund 71. Okay, so that's 23,000. So that's pretty big. Yeah. Okay, that's all I had. Mr. Mayor, I move that the consent agenda as presented be approved. Okay. We've got a motion and second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Okay, we are ready for agenda item number three, which is water lines to serve, not Chris, ninth edition. Yes, Mayor and Commissioners, we're asking you tonight to consider authorizing us to issue bonds, general obligation bonds, on the installation and constructions of water lines to serve the Chris 9th edition. Um, we're getting this set up in, um, as kind of a last resort. Um, it's hopeful that we can pay for this project out of budgeted funds. But to be able, in the off chance that we do have to go to long-term financing, we need to get this set up prior to construction beginning. Um, so we're asking you to take that step tonight. Um, we've estimated the project um, total cost to be $91,020. Um, the city will utilize a contractor to, for the installation of the pipe, fire hydrants, and valves, connections. The city will supply the material um, for the project. So this uh, project will serve 22 new lots in the Chris 9th edition. Um, at the same time, we'll be doing water lines in Belmont 3rd edition. I don't want to confuse the two, but that project will be totally done by city staff and out of the water fund. Um, this Chris 9th edition, if, if you all have driven by there, um, it's quite rocky, and uh, we need uh, contractors that specialize in that rock excavation to, be, to get up there and do that work. And it's our expectation that we will issue as small a piece of debt as possible. And so if we can do this, I think that there's enough room in the budget to do it without it, but we can't come up short. Once you, once you spend it, you can't go backwards. And so this just authorizes us to use debt and this is the full amount of the project, and so it's just a... Um, if need be. If need be. We're going to pay cash as much as we can. It's, it's been a while, a long time, since we've had a development with 22 lots, let alone two developments, with the other having 14 lots in the same year. So 
we're going to try to manage within that budget, just like Herb said, but this gives us a chance to. And as an example, every year we budget to replace a lift station, maybe not a good example because that's wastewater, but every year we budget to replace a lift station. We do a good job of maintaining those lift stations, so every year we budget to do the same one and, and we never do it. Um, but if it happens, if it fails, it's past its useful life, we have the money to do it. And so um, that's our expectation on this as well, that there's contingencies built in the budget and that's how we'll do it. Any questions, fellas? Resolution number? 2746. I move that resolution number 2746, a resolution of the City of El Dorado, Kansas, authorizing improvements to the city public water supply system and providing for the payment of the cost thereof, project number 457. Second. Okay, a motion and second. Any discussion? You guys kind of hit a couple of my points. <clears throat> rock claws. When we got into this and saying free water lines and free storm, it, it, does this 91,000 cover all our rock expense? Because there is a lot of rock out there. And somebody asked me, you know, do you ever look at a project that just costs too much in rock to do? And I couldn't answer that. And I just wondered if there was any kind of rock claws in that. With the, with the equipment, now we, we did ask for two bids on this project. We are going with the numbers you're looking at tonight does have a low bid of the contractor. Um, but when they own that, own those equipments like, own that equipment like rock trenchers or, or um, large motor graders, or rippers, and, and they own that sort of equipment, it's really just as easy for them to get in there and do that work as if it was, you know, dirt. I mean, fusion lies in a little different type of equipment and there, it narrows the gap of who's able to bid on those sorts of projects. But um, So you're saying there's not a lot of extra expense because of rock? Well, when, you, when, when we looked at the phase two of the Belmont Heights bid exactly at the same time of Chris Knight, and you look at those numbers um, for street excavation for storm sewer, very similar in pricing. Mm -hmm. Are we going to take this $91,020 and put it on a temp note? Is that the plan? To start, because you're, you're not going to go do a GO bond just for $91,000. No. It would be, right. it, yeah, temp financed and then if. Okay. Okay. Any other questions, guys? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Okay, ready for American Legion parking lot uh, update from city attorney. Mr. Mayor, commissioners, uh, per the tenor of the last discussion, including the oft-mentioned uh, language in the agreements that we would try to find common ground with the Legion where possible, I had called Mr. Hendricks, the commander of the Legion Post, and as yet I have not received any return call from him, so I do not have any update beyond that. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, we're ready for uh, agenda item number five, new business discussion items. So which commissioner would like to go first tonight? I'd like to start. I've got a, I've got a few things that I wanted to discuss tonight. Um, you know, we just got done talking about the Chris Ninth and Belmont edition out there. We've, I think, made a lot of progress in opening up some new sites, some new developments in El Dorado. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about infill. I know that historically, and, and maybe you can help me with this, Herb, but I know that historically we have um, – we have budgeted money to buy properties, and generally we've been using that money to buy properties, correct me if I'm wrong, in the floodplain uh, to help kind of with our FEMA um, availability of FEMA funds if, if we do have a flood problem. That's separate. correct. Um, you know, I think there's some opportunities for infill for some neighborhood revitalization, whether it's a single household. Um, you know, I think the mayor's talked about it at, at times. I know he did during his campaign, but... 
I'm about doing entire blocks or trying to find some opportunities. But I'd like to, I'd like to, if we've got support from the commission, I think I'd like to see if we could direct staff to do a little extra research on what kind of federal money might be available, some federal or state grants, some opportunities to really throw some resources at revitalizing, um, you know, what we currently have in our in our stock in town. I love what we're doing. We've Dave and I have been a part of this housing task force now for a couple of years, and you know, it was absolutely necessary to, to get some new development because we didn't have any lots to build on. Um, but a big part of what we've talked about in that task force is the need for infill and the need for revitalizing within our neighborhoods as well. So, I mean, if I've got support from the rest of the commission, or the commission on this, I, I'd like to direct staff to um, do some research, find out what other communities are doing, come back to us, talk find out what uh, federal funding is available. I know that there's programs out there. Um, I've had opportunities to do some research myself and some other people that have contacted me have had a lot of opportunities too. So I know that there's, a, there's resources, and I think that what I'd like to see you guys do is gather those up, show us what's available, and then we can talk about maybe putting something together. And I think that Linda might be able to help with some of that as well, if you guys are on board with that. Yeah, I'd be in support of that. Um, do you have any questions on that, Herb? Yes, How much money do we? I mean, it was I. We throw a lot at, at the floodplain properties. We get the houses out of there, and then it just turns to green space, obviously, because we can't build. So when we talk about how many properties El Dorado owns all over town, a lot of it's that. It's our um, desire, our, you know, kind of the city's desire to help alleviate some of that those properties in the floodplains, which improves our um, rating with FEMA in the event of a, of a disaster, especially a flood disaster. So how much do we do you think we do each we year? We budget 15000 a year. Um, we probably, if we don't use it, we put it, we put it in a set-aside fund, so it's a project fund, so it'll carry over. Um, the vast majority of our work is done in the floodplain, though this year we did do two that are on that are above the floodplain? Yeah, we are oh, actually that, able yeah. to purchase about three properties outside of the floodplain this year. Then. Have we got those two for sale yet? We did. But two of them, two of them, we cleaned them off and they're ready for houses, so they will go. I mean, because there's definitely some houses, sell some houses that could use to be, you know. The, the, you bet. There's the no special on. Um, but there would be a good opportunity. Business to have ready-built lots available for some infill. And we, we have developers, we have builders in town that want to do infill. So I think it's a great project. I think it's a good opportunity. I think another thing to look at, I just got the notice from the county today of the upcoming tax sale. And there's typically a lot of properties on that that have issues um, and that get passed on. And we'd like to have the ability to get in there take a look at those properties, let the potential buyer be aware of the issues those structures may have, um, or even, even somehow, you know, and, and this could be discussed. These are just ideas I'm having, but, you know, we're, how we could help with demolition or something to clean up some of these properties. They're just getting passed on and passed on in tax sales. And I, and I think at the housing committee meeting, the housing task force, we've talked about some of those kind of incentives for infill too. So maybe it's a good opportunity. I know Herb and Scott, both of you have been um, are on that, that housing task force too. But if you guys could put some stuff together and kind of get back to us, I would appreciate it. Okay. Can I throw two things real quick, Bill, at that? Because I agree totally with you. One is that I, I've always said there was this company that had done this research at Hutch that I would sure like to have them come down and we talk sometime. You know, that uh, I, I just think that there was some stuff in that, and I don't want to get off in that, but that wouldn't cost anything talking in that area because they kind of come in and look and see where your town is and what you're trying to do with that. Two, I don't know what it's called, but it's like a city land bank that they've been talking at the league meetings about. So right. we, need, we need to learn about that stuff. So that's yeah, and that's what I've been researching, that. which kind of made me. Well, and we did, and so you know. Inc. looked at, at the land bank. It didn't seem like it would help us. And, Linda, you're here. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. It just looked to me like the advantages didn't make as much sense in El Dorado as they do maybe in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, it's 
put some but stuff together if you guys could and, get in <laughs> and let us know yeah. what some options are. Um, I had a good opportunity to talk to, uh, to, actually I talked to James a little bit earlier about this as well. We, I've, uh, in 2009, I was on the Planning Commission. We worked on the comprehensive plan. Um, one of the things that it talks about in the comprehensive plan, and this kind of touches some on what Linda was talking about, and, and I'm bringing this up because we've been um, working on a piece of this, but was the community-wide Wi-Fi or city-wide Wi-Fi. I know that um, I know that there's a public a service, a public piece of that that we can work on. That you guys have talked about for meter reading, uh, for connection to police cars and, and, and kind of our fleet. I wanted to just kind of ask Herb, in the comprehensive plan, there's discussion about um, kind of forming a steering committee, understanding the feasibility of it, trying to work with some partnerships, maybe with some providers. Have, have we dove into that at all from a, on a, a private side, or are we, are we just looking at it on the public side right now? The, um when the commission took that issue up, and it's, like you said, it's been several years ago, we looked at it, and um, the impetus for the city at the time was um, the uh, need was meter reading and the ease with which it can do it. And so, um, so it's custom. Besides being now, we don't have to look at every meter every month. If you came in with your water bill and said it's higher than normal um, with Wi-Fi enabled meters, our clerk could type it up and see if you're using water right now. It's like, is anyone home right now? Well, your water's spinning, and so it would enhance um, our ability f for customer service. And then the other thing that that I desired with it again on the public side was um, our ca our patrol cars have cameras in them, and we just record it to a DVD player, I think. And I'd love to stream it. And if we had Wi-Fi, um, dispatch could be seeing live what the policeman sees, and so. Um, it, we wouldn't have any missing components in a stop. And so, you know, we would protect our officer, we'd protect the public. It's We want everyone to have as much information as they want, so I'd love to stream it. So that was kind of the motivator. And so we talked with a couple companies. One I thought was going to come in and do it, and they were very reasonably priced. And then the owner got ill and we never heard from him. And then we talked to another company and then it went from a couple hundred thousand maybe to a couple million maybe. And um, and that wasn't even a consideration for me. And so that's kind of where it stopped. And since then, we've been um, piddling internally and starting to put in some backbone. Is that the right word? And yes. so, so today, you can, the first rollout use was something at the airport. I think you can see the weather now out there that hey, boss. So, I, so I think though the, today so though, to, for private side. Private side. So challenges, I think there's the Chanute model that, that has been kicked around at, at the league meeting before and, and, and you can research. I mean, What's, what are the hindrances, aside from cost at this point, what are the hindrances you think on the private side? I think the, the big one for the city is that private providers are trying to legislate statewide cities' inability to deploy Wi-Fi, um, not only for the private side, but even for our use. They don't want us to have the ability to stream data. And so... Um, Hopefully, our officials in Topeka w wouldn't inhibit us, and I don't know, every every good businessman that I've ever talked to doesn't mind fair competition, but they want it to be fair. They want everyone to play on the same field. So um, I don't 
I don't know why it'd be a problem other than if you can have a monopoly, maybe you want it. I think that, you know, when Linda was up earlier talking about um, some of their target sectors, I think it made me think more about this as well as technology being a target sector. I mean, you know, the comprehensive plan lists El Dorado as a city of the arts. We obviously um, have a very, very strong working class in, in El Dorado, and I think that this uh, there's a lot in El Dorado that can move us, uh, provide opportunities to uh, to kind of move us towards a city of technology as well. And so, you know, if you guys could look at the comprehensive plan, how it discusses um, that piece of the uh, of of technology, and kind of just give me your interpretation, give us your interpretation on that, if you don't mind, and and let us know what the steps would be to explore that some more. I would appreciate that. Okay. Um, Nick and Chase and I had an opportunity to be at the ribbon cutting for the new CNG fill station, which was is awesome. Um, and I was hoping that uh, Brad could give us an update on how how things are rolling there. The weather did not cooperate very well to begin with no, it didn't. Um, for the grand opening for the ribbon cutting for it. Um, we did pack, um, we'd say probably close to 100, 110 people in for uh, that amount of time that we had them that morning prior to the lunch and learn that was put on at the Civic Center. Um, we, we had some elected officials there. Commissioner Young was there for the initial um, onset. We went to the lunch and learn and then came back uh, right after that was over and actually cut the ribbon, if you will. Um, we had lots of representatives from uh, One Gas, who was uh, a great partner for us to, to partner with uh, in that project. Uh, the most important thing to me is the fact that we got to recognize our employees uh, for the hard work that they did uh, making uh, that station uh, come to life. Now, if you've been on the commission for a while, you heard uh, Herb talk about things that we do that most cities our size do not do. Uh, this is one of those projects. Most cities our size would have hired a contractor to come in, turnkey it, and they'd be filling vehicles. Uh, they would have also written a fairly large check to a contractor, engineering firm, to be able to do that. Um, we did 99% of that work in-house. Uh, so when, we, when I say we, uh, there was lots of different aspects to make that, uh, make that grand opening happen. And it, was, it was nice to be able to stand there and, and uh, brag on our employees once again for the, the work that they've done. So since that, since that time, we have taken delivery of a, com a combo truck, a sewer flusher vac truck, if you will, um, that is a dedicated CNG truck. We have currently a dedicated CNG uh, dump truck and also on order a dedicated CNG street sweeper, uh, all of which... Um, will be off of the OPEC side of things. Uh, it'll be on, on our natural gas. Um, we also have um, converted, successfully been trained, factory trained, and converted a pickup as of right now. And we have uh, two vehicles in the shop right now that are in the process of being converted, uh, one of which we're waiting on our trainer guy to come back because it's a hair more challenging than we had anticipated, and they thought so as well, so that's why we put it off to, to do it um, later. He'll be back this week to continue that training. Once we're done with that, we're pretty much done with our, with our certification, with our training to be able to uh, do these installations from, from this company, uh, and then we'll be on the road with them. So uh, those are two police vehicles that are uh, in the shop right now. Uh, in the process of being converted. So. One of the examples that you talked about that day was uh, one of the trucks, a vac truck, dump truck, one of your trucks that used $32,000 a year in diesel. 
and on CNG, do we use eight thousand dollars a year of CNG? That is our automated refuse truck, okay. uh, our automated, our, our one arm truck, if you will, that dumps all the carts around town. Uh, it makes a complete cycle through town each week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, that vehicle uses just about eight thousand gallons of diesel fuel a year, which running the trash department for as long that's not an un, unheard of number um, at four bucks a gallon diesel that's thirty two thousand dollars a year on cng if our costs were one dollar per gallon which they are substantially less than that we believe um, if our costs were one dollar that would save us about twenty four thousand dollars a year on that one vehicle alone so that's just one, and what we did was this was not something that we just uh, that we just picked and pick and chose which vehicles that we did. We analyzed our our fleet. We know what vehicles use the most fuel. We know how they use their fuel. Um, we've we identified during that process three years ago some problems, identified those, corrected those, but our refuse vehicles were our top users, as you can imagine, because they run all the time. Um, those were our top users of, of fuel. And so we identified those target areas that we could, and we, we went after those first. Now, um, my anticipation is, is that staff will put together a proposal to get rid of, sell, trade, except however we choose to do it, the existing truck, and lease purchase a different truck that will be a dedicated CNG vehicle. That said, what you can sell the truck for today and your savings over five years will pay for the cost of that truck. Um, so there's lots of ways to look at doing things that will benefit us long term that you'll see an instant savings right away in, in, right. in being able to do that. And a five-year payback on a vehicle that big at the end of that five years, um, the, the savings is yours, is yours to have. Well, I said it that day, and I wanted to just take this opportunity to say again, I, I commend staff for self-performing the vast majority of that work. Um, I think that as a commission, we've asked Curb and staff to hold the line or reduce costs as much as possible in order to not have to increase uh, the mill levy. And, and it's, in my opinion, um, thinking outside, the, getting rid of the box, to th uh, you know, being innovative like this is, is ways that we're going to save money. Um, and, and be able to be more efficient for the taxpayers. So I appreciate that. One of our, our, our second highest budget line item in our budgets are fuel items, Absolutely. our fuel lines. And so we want to try to take care of those and utilities by becoming more efficient to do things that, that we can do that with. So. Thank you, Brad. Great. Well, Brad, you got any kind of idea what our total costs are? Because you know, I, when I drove around back there, there's quite a bit of cement, new cement around. And when you drive around the little port and curb and gutters, what, what, what kind of costs, even manpower, if you, if you didn't look at any numbers, exactly what this has cost today? To I, don't, I don't have anything right off the top of my head, no, sir. Okay. I thought that would be kind of interesting to understand that part. I don't know. Surely somebody's tracking that. We are tracking it, but I don't yeah. have any totals yet. Okay. So. And we're going to be selling CNG? We're working that direction. Um, there's, there's several pieces to, with that, to that puzzle to make that available to the general public that, that we have to be able to be able to take their credit card. So, so just to clarify, though, for the public, the, the primary purpose of this fill station is for our use. There's no place else in town that offers it, so the only reason that we would be selling it is because if someone needs it. But if, if a service of Quick Trip starts selling CNG, we're not going to be in competition with Quick, quick Trip. That is, You'll have to tell us to be in competition. Okay. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, guys, tonight. Three more real quick things. The first one would be um, James came up and talked about videos on the website. Um, I think all of us have the intention of trying to get the information out to the public. Uh, in as timely a way as we can. And so um, at the last meeting, there were, I think, a handful of times that Chase and I both referenced, hey, this information is on the website. Go download it, read it, check it out, and give us your comments. Um, I just wanted to make sure that 
that that is the case when we make those comments, and, and it has been. So I appreciate that. But I also think it's an opportunity to look at the tech, look at the technology in that room back there, and find if we can just stream the rather than saving the four gig video and having someone download it to watch. If there's a way we can stream these and then archive them. And I know it's I know that we have hindrances on because of the technology there. The website is fully functional to be able to live stream. No, I understand that. It's it's, it's in the, it's the, in the equipment. End. I get right. that. That's so why I'm just curious if we can. We're working that. on the best way to put the videos on the site. Um, it's probably gonna be through YouTube at first and then hopefully move in the direction of people watching live. Sure. Um, but again I just want to make sure that as we direct people to the website that, that information's out there when we do that. The other thing would be, um, I had a lot of, appreciate the calls and the comments about our dog ordinance. Um, and I think that kind of our direction at the last meeting was that we would be ready to address this at the next meeting, the second meeting in October. So I appreciate those calls and encourage people to continue um, with that. And uh, kind of the same comment on the community market. I've received a lot of feedback about the community market, both uh, in favor of and against. So. Um, when we get to that point to discuss, then, then we've got that, and I appreciate the plan being out there and some of the information on the website. So I'm done. I can go real quick. Uh, I'll echo Bill's thoughts on the Wi-Fi. I enjoyed the El Redo 316 guys and their sporadic thoughts on that. Um, but I think that's an interesting concept and something that I'd be interested to know more about. Um, Herb, would it be possible if and I am sure a lot of you guys have this, and I misplaced the Legion lease, but if I could get that again, and maybe just any cost that the city has associated with the Legion. Um, Shane brought up some points at the last meeting, and just for history's sake, or for my, myself, not being aware of some of that stuff that happened before my time, I would appreciate that if that wasn't a big deal. Sure, and we used to have that lease on our website, didn't we, under the documents section? Oh, is it up there? I, I'll oh. be surprised if it's not. Well, I'll just but, go look it up. But um, for years, the commission has wanted big document things yeah. to be on the website. And so and I guess I'll be surprised if it's not there, but yeah. we'll and check I'll, and, I'll and make sure. Look at that. But if there's any other cost or anything specific kind of associated with the Legion, just for history's sake, that sure. do, I would appreciate we that. Do we put them in their own line, or are they combined with other lines? They're combined, but it's easy. It should be pretty easy to pull. Okay. Get with yeah. her. Well, we'll just we'll get it, and okay. I'll send it out to everybody. I'd appreciate that. Um, real quick, I want to congratulate Susan B. Allen. They had a wonderful uh, event about a week and a half ago. And it just goes another example to show the uniqueness of our community and a community our size. I think raised that campaign raised over a million dollars for the cancer center. And so what a wonderful thing for folks in our community that are going through a tough battle to be able to get those services here. Um, and so big congratulations to all them. That's, it was a really cool night and they worked really hard to make that happen. Um, I guess we'll probably talk about the market here in a few minutes. And then, yeah, a lot of positive calls about the dogs um, on both sides. The only thing I was curious about in regards to what we looked at in the ordinance, and I wasn't sure if you guys had any thoughts, um, the muzzle, whenever a dog is being walked, they'd have to have a muzzle on. I just didn't know if that was maybe appropriate early on or if that was something I mean obviously if they were had an incident put a muzzle on but if they were just and that's not something we have to figure out now but I don't know if anyone had any thoughts or feedback get it to Brad I kind of spoke with him briefly um, but that's really the only thing that I've had feedback on or people concerned with how they transport their dog or keep them in their backyard I guess the only time that it would have a muzzle is if there had already been an incident or it was a pit bull. And so I think I th that piece is in both. Right. Yeah, in I both think it was the pit bull part. It, it was the pit bull part. Yeah. I think the question is that there was there were some registration, um, spay and neuter, you know, the, the, the 
there were some pieces of the pit bull ordinance that um, everybody agreed with that emailed me or contacted me that the only two questions were the the kind of the fence or the kennel and then the muzzling um, and I think they were just the comments I got that they were looking for kind of a clean slate and then if there was a problem then they would and I yeah, and I respect those comments I'm just sharing those are the few that I heard in regards yeah. to the ordinance that no, that's what I'm saying up. I agree with that. but I I mean at the same time I'm okay with Aaron on the safe side of things, but I just don't know if anyone yeah. had any thoughts about that. I'm just curious kind of what, what, what data went into that. The muzzle, the muzzling piece on all of it was to assure that if the animal were to get away from its responsible owner, say the person trips on a something on the sidewalk or in the street or whatever, that if that animal does get away from them, that there's still a piece of protection for someone else someone else's animal the human aspect of that so that was a that was a very common that was a very common piece in, in all of them that if okay. they were if they had been declared dangerous that that they had to be muzzled when off the property now i don't think that that would be required when it's on the owner's property but just just, as, just when they're walking that they had the shorter the shorter leash and that they were muzzled again, and it was it was solely for the protection of if they were to something were to happen to the person walking them. So, cool. So when they're declared dangerous, so that is, so the pit bulls they're declared dangerous then at birth. No, or no, they they would just they would fall and if if you all so chose to adopt a different variation of our current pit bull ordinance. They would they would have to fall under the criteria to be able to keep the pit bull, which would be sterilization, uh, chipping, and and then the other rules for keeping them. I don't I don't have them all right here in front of me, but um, they would they're not declared dangerous right away. That the, the, you like just you have said, everybody special, starts with a clean slate, except except the pit bulls who, who have different rules for being able to keep that breed of animal if you guys chose to adopt it as, it, as it's written. So, yeah, every, there are no dangerous dogs right now. You would have to, there would have to be an incident occur for you to be declared a dangerous, right. a dangerous dog. So. Okay, thanks Brad. You bet. And last thing, just real quickly, Brad, too, thank you for uh, Walnut River Festival. It was another great event, um, a huge turnout with that, and a wonderful event that kind of gives everyone in the community an opportunity. It's a free event to come down and have fun and be entertained. And Brad was available all day to deal with power issues and helping the folks down there. So thanks to staff for that. And That'll do for now. I don't have anything. I don't have anything. It's kind of heavy over here and light over here. Usually it. Yeah. <laughs> Just look. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh. Oh. Here, go it's ahead. a little youthful on this side, too, though. <laughs> so we, we, uh, I was going to ask on the, farmer, <laughs> on the farmer's market, which building are we talking about? Is it the west one or the east one? East one. It's the east one. Okay. Just the lumber yard. Just the lumber yard. I drove around that today, and I was noticed that in those cement blocks, there's a lot of structural cracks through that. And I just wondered if we had a structural engineer look at those things. Are we going to have a big problem down the road, or and just? You know, uh, and I have been in it a long time. I'm talking about the outside now. Yeah, we had a <clears throat> excuse me, a structural engineer from Wichita, an engineering firm, come over and do a walkthrough of that building. He walk around the outside. Yeah. Because I'm telling you, down the southeast corner of that, there's pretty good crack running up that, and then you can see where there's been cracks that they've tried to mortar in. And he's telling you there's no problem. Well, and I don't, I don't think it's structural. Do you? Uh, the interior's think. all. Wood structure. I don't. I guess I can't answer to those outside walls, but the interior is all timber. It was nothing really concerning. Yeah, it's a timber structure with right. some interior masonry rooms. And 
I, I can't quite remember. I, there might be some veneer masonry on it as well. Southeast corner, go by and look at it, Scott. Because that, that caught mine. Uh, have we signed a purchase contract on that herb? I think we have, as a matter so of fact. So we've already bought it then? You haven't bought it, but you've actually, you have a, no, con, uh, we have something. We have an option, option to purchase. Okay. But. Can I see but, a copy of that sometime? I expect. But if the commission doesn't take action to stop it, as I think you were explained last week, there's been multiple votes from the commission to move forward with this. And we will be closing on it soon unless, unless I, three of you tell me to stop, we will own it, and I think we've even picked a closing date. Okay. Well, I'd just like to see the purchase contract. Sure. If I could. A signed purchase contract. Well, and I don't, I don't know that I have that. I think we have an option on it. I think. <coughs> there you go. Oh, okay. All but right. you can have a copy of it. I mean, sure. It's electronic, isn't it? Well, we can scan it. And actually, I think I signed it and sent it to the title company, and so I don't have it. With both sides signed? Okay. Okay, we'll get you one there. Okay. Uh, Brewer Water District 3 has sent me a letter, and I think I gave all the commissioners a copy of that letter. Yeah, they sent it to all of us. Yeah. So, Jim, do you have any kind of update or where we're at with that kind of deal? Let me do it for you. We, that's what your executive is about, Mayor. Okay. Okay. Um, I was going to ask street improvement update. Scott, I've had people ask me about Tawanda Street, when was it going to start, and what kind of projects we got going on right now in the city on streets. Sure. Uh, we actually got quite a, quite a few projects going on. Um, Tawanda Avenue is still anticipating um, starting on the pavement type work road construction this spring. Um, Still design hopeful to get is, some utilities. Design is underway. Design is underway. Still hopeful to get some utilities and some piping work done yet this winter. The project on 4th and 5th Avenue um, just got its surface lift of asphalt today, its final layer of asphalt. Back, back fills complete. Um, really, the only thing we have left out there to wrap up is seating and some cleanup of some yards, but it, it's a really nice looking project. And I think the majority of those property owners along those streets have, have uh, or like the appearance the road has given them, and, and really the project's gone quite smoothly and very quickly. Um, today we started milling on the areas of Third and Broadview and State, those areas out on the west side of town. That's part of our sales tax project. Um, in those areas, they're receiving a two-inch mill of the existing asphalt surface, and two inches of new asphalt will be placed right behind. Um, moving quite quickly, uh, it's not too often we see the paver right behind the mill machine, but that was occurring today, so that was a good sign. Um, the 600 block of North Summit, um, hopeful to be looking at next week for a tear out of that road, and that will be a complete re rebuild. The curb and gutter and the driveways will remain, but we'll tear out all of that pavement and build it back up from the base. That will work in conjunction with the paving out at Chris 9th. Um, the same contractor will be doing that work. So this dirt crews have a little bit of work out there to put the um, gravel base for the road in and then they'll move on to the 600 block of North Summit. Um, anticipating getting a bid tomorrow on the repaving of Olive from High Street to Gordy. Um, work with a contractor today on some changes and, and some different type of materials to see that we can get something done on that this year yet. 
see what else we had. In Belmont Third, um, we got the gravel base down today out there. Curb and gutter Wednesday, they're telling us, and then we'll see pavement right behind it. So it's a lot of street work and going on right now. And then the two concrete streets, what are they? Um, Public Works is going to undertake the Cave Springs and Atchison. We spoke out at the last meeting, and I think they are a month or a couple weeks out on that. So. I was going to look uh, out there in front of Community National. Do we still have a problem out there? Did we ever sit down with anybody and work that thing out somehow? Or? When uh, police chief and myself went and met with the Walmart, um, discussed, discussed what they see occurring out there, if there was any potential collaboration on some type of um, solution. Had some of those discussions. Um, I really haven't looked at it too closely here lately, but it had got some dirt back filled in, and I think immediately that same day someone drove through it. Um, so the problem still exists. I mean, I looked this weekend, and there's it's a still hole. There. Could, could we put cement in there like you did at Sixth Street? We could. It's just a. Uh, it, I'm just. Yeah, because I think 6th Street long term is still going to be a problem, in my opinion. But it looks better and it's, it's working better than what was working. So, just a thought. I, I'm saying what we're doing right now, something needs to be done. It just looks bad coming into town. That and, and Walmart didn't want to help? They said there could be a potential of some sort of, some sort of. They didn't see it that, that it was their, um, they were causing it um, or, or anything. Did recognize though that they do invite truckers to stay in their lot and, and visit their stores, and um, so they're open to some sort of collaboration, potentially. Good. Uh, West Central lights out in front of Walmart. Since you're talking about that, I got a guy there. Every time I see him, he says, "Mike, you haven't fixed the lights yet." I've been noticing that myself very carefully, and it just seems like there's times of the day that you really back up traffic and nobody else is coming the other way. And I didn't know if there's some way of the timing mechanism, you know, somebody coming out of Walmart that that light can change quicker. Just, I'm just saying that I, I feel like there's still a timing problem there. Now, you guys might disagree with me, but that's... No, the we, I mean, it resets and has problems and we fix them all the time we had we had issues out there last week that we had a camera that was pointed off and it it will go to what's called constant call and so it cycles the intersection until somebody calls and says hey it's not working another one of the wi-fi issue one of wi one of the things a wi-fi will help with is we will be able to have all of those traffic control boxes all coming to one location so that we can monitor that a little bit closer. We won't have to rely on people coming to tell us that. But um, it's the camera over there on the Casey's Interest Bank side. Uh, the wind plays havoc with that. And now, I've got a question. I'm sorry. You, that, that camera on, so that's on the south side. Yes, sir. Facing north. It's on a short pedestal up there. And I've noticed that for the most part, most of your cameras around town, you guys have moved to a longer pedestal so that when the wind catches the the whole arm, it doesn't move the camera as much. Or is there a plan to, to make that adjustment there? No, we took the long pole off of that one because the wind was so was much moving that, that one it moved the camera of too much to, okay. to do that. But please don't confuse timing with cameras because those are two entirely right. different things. We don't have any we don't have any timed intersections in El Dorado. We have, we have uh, cameras that monitor that. And again, um, I got the call the other night that it was malfunctioning, went out there, sure enough, the camera was off, reset the camera, sat there for 30 minutes and watched it, everything was fine. Um, it cycled when a car pulled up, watched it from the box, and then watched it from the truck for a little while, and, and everything was fine after that. I get those calls periodically as well. One of the biggest problems with that is people will pull all the way up, past the bar, and if it's a single car, uh, if it's one car that pulls up facing southbound on Village Road, that car pulls up. Uh, way out of the advance of the stop bar, and and the camera will pick it up. It'll when it goes that far outside of that 
that stop bar, it believes that that car went ahead and turned to go west. It believes it went ahead and made a right turn, which is legal to make a right turn on red after, after stopping. So the camera set system then resets, and it has to wait for someone else to pull up there to trip that camera. And that may trip northbound when someone pulls out of Walmart or goes to the turn lane there, but generally when we go fix that, when we go do that, we run it several different directions to make sure that it's picking up after after it relearns itself. So there are no timings, though. They're, they're not timed intersections. And so if it's timed, then yeah. it means there's a problem, and you need a, no offense, Mayor, but they don't need to call you. They need to call the city, and we'll go out and fix it. And right. as bad a system as it is, um, the best way to get it fixed is just tell us, because we run out and we fix it, and that's what we do. And so don't people don't need to put up with a light that didn't work right, they just need to call us, tell us, and we'll go out and fix it. And unfortunately, that intersection gets a lot of wind. And and the other thing Brad alluded to, people stop way in front of that stop bar. The camera doesn't see them, or they think, like Brad said, that it's gone through it and it doesn't have a car. So if you think easing up is going to help you, it doesn't. You need to probably back up. So the camera sees the car. Six and, so, and Main, for instance, when we moved the stop bar back and made some changes to the to the pavement markings there, we left the boxes on that way out there. The problem at Village and Central is we don't have as much room to work with as we do at Sixth and Main headed eastbound. So you can fit a whole entire car out in front of the stop bar at Sixth and Main eastbound. But because of the amount of area we had to work with with the, with the cameras, we moved the box out so that if someone does pull out beyond the stop bar, they can the camera will pick them up there. We don't have the ability to do that at Village because if we do, the box will be all the way out and it'll detect it could detect cross traffic on 254. So we don't have the ability to to uh, fix folks that pull beyond the stop bar. But I mean, Man, if somebody's pulling out of Walmart and it's one car and they turn, how long is it before the light turns? You know, if there's other cars sitting in You didn't say which direction are they turning, east well, or westbound coming out of Walmart. say eastbound. You They're going eastbound. They'll get a, they can go eastbound with, it, it, will, it will sense the car and it'll see if the car is going to sit there. If the car goes ahead and, go, goes ahead and turns, then it won't set a call into the box. Okay. So if you go straight north and they get through the intersection, it's the only car, is it 10 seconds? What no, it's timing? those, KDOT gives us those, those timings. It has to be a certain amount of time to safely get cross traffic stopped, run the pedestrian signals, and then, then they can, then we can, then they can, then it will cycle the lights the opposite direction. But it's a pretty short window. I mean, if one car came, it's not going to be a minute. No, 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 no. It's seconds. No, it's 25 seconds. It's, yeah. it's, it just depends on what intersection it is. Right. Yeah. Okay. The speed of the vehicles. Denver and Central is quick. I mean, the light turns green. Summit and Central is quick. Summit, Summit and Central yeah. is quick. Yeah. Really quick. It is absolutely quick. So, um, and if that's what you mean by timings, the amount of time before the lights will cycle, that's cycle. different than, than, than timing the intersections. Okay. So. But on, but... Going east and west, if you're on central, you have there's a lot more time on those signals right. to clear than there is on on the crossroads. The, the, the crossroads, but the real thing, I mean, if it seems like it's broken, just call us. Hmm. Um, but call us, we'll we'll be happy to go out and we'll, look at it and see. They break and and we fix them. Yeah. Thank you. Wind blows. Only other thing I was wanting to bring up, I was hoping that we could take the wind turbine expenses like year to date. Do we track those? Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in seeing the actual expenses to that year to date. Okay. Are you? Is it your month? Okay. That's all I got. And do the revenue side too. <laughs> yeah. Is that going to be through the end of, what do you think, in the end of September, Kurt, on what you're going to have? 
Are we closed? Have we closed October? September? Yeah, yeah, I can do in September. In September. I mean, that's a big September, and he'll probably have most of October as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. So we're ready for a city manager's report? Yes, sir. Um, the I wanted to report last month. Um, the city of Wichita tested several skunks and they came up with rabies. Um, and again, Brad, you can help me when I speak incorrectly. Um, and so there was a tremendous amount of news coverage of the rabies and the talk about it. And the thing I came away with that discussion was they interviewed a vet and he said, it's not a big deal. You just need to get your pets vaccinated and everything's fine. And so um, here a week or so ago, a woman called in and had a skunk in her backyard in the daytime. And it was odd, so we went and picked it up and had it tested. And most skunks test positive for rabies because they're a carrier. So to get one that tested negative is strange, but this one was out in the day and so we tested it and, uh, and it came up positive. And so I um, wanted to reiterate, want to tell you all about it, tell you it's common and um, correspondence with I had with a vet tech in town, she said that you'd have to prove to her that it didn't have rabies, that that's her expectation, that any any skunk you test is going to show positive for rabies. And so um, part of that state process that they want you to go through is an investigation, look at the area, look in the neighborhood, do a bunch of stuff. It's 40-some pages, 30, 37 pages of stuff. Um, we now have all that complete. and. Um, and just wanted to let you know and the city know that we picked up a skunk, tested positive, um, get your pets vaccinated every year like the laws in the city of Eldorado say, and, uh, and it'll probably be fine. If you see anything acting strange, again, don't wonder about it. Just call us and we'll come out and do what we need to do, no matter what kind of animal it is. But um, we did. We did pick one up. It was acting different, and it tested positive, which is, I guess, what we expect. And um, and I want to let you all know about it and the community know. And so, um, again, keep your pets vaccinated. And if you see something acting strange, call us, and we'll come out and take a look at it. Um, I wanted to um, also kind of remind the commission that, um, and the community that our NRP process expires in the end of the year. And so staff is starting to start those stakeholder meetings, get input on what and if, how we go forward. And so that's going to start um, in the past. You know, we invite all the um, stakeholders. So all your governmental agencies will get invited. They'll get input. They'll understand what we're doing. Um, I've already talked to uh, two, two of them, and so started had some conversations preliminary with me, but um, I, I think once again they'll be engaged and we'll come back with you with something, but they'll give you a recommendation and we'll get that yet this year. Also want to remind you that the uh, Kansas League of Municipalities is this weekend. And Tab, if you can remind everyone of the dates. I believe we have three commissioners um, signed up to go to the league this weekend. It starts on Saturday at 4 p.m. That's the round tables. Um, those go till 5.30 and 5.30 to 7 is the host city event. Sunday morning, the trade show opens at 9 a.m. Workshops start at 10.30 and go to 6 p.m. Monday, and then they'll have the social event that evening. Um, Monday, affiliate breakfast are at 8 a.m. and workshops start at 9.30 and go to 3.30 that day. 
And that's all I had. I had, if I, could, I had one more quick thing. The manager's report reminded me of this. You had sent out a letter to us last week, an email to all of us last week, um, indicating that there was some interest in Sedgwick County to discuss water. Um, I think that all of us kind of chimed in on that. I, I've, I definitely have an interest to, to be involved in that discussion. Um, with that being said, I'm, I'm not overly comfortable with us engaging in that discussion until after their elections. I don't want kind of our discussion with them to, to have any um, sway or impact on their on their own municipal or county elections. Um, but once that's done, I'm interested in being involved. Um, I would certainly encourage you, Mayor, to, to be involved in any of the commissioners. I think as many as we can to be involved. It's an informational discussion only, just to kind of, they just, they just have questions about our, our water. And, and I think it's an opportunity to just have a dialogue without making offers or trying to sell water. Um, but I would encourage all the commissioners to, to consider um, once we are able to set that up, uh, to consider being able to attend that and, and just and visit with, with Sedgwick County. But I really don't want to do it before they have their elections. I'm not comfortable with that. I would agree with that. And I think, um, you, you know, there are times when, when we talk about meeting outside of a regular meeting of wanting to limit it to two, and so it's not a meeting. I'm not sure that this isn't too important of an item that if three or four or five of you want to go, we'll just publish it a meeting and call it a meeting, go on, that um, uh, this, is, this is too big a deal to not have um, the elected officials involved in my estimation. And especially when what's being discussed is going over and visiting with their commission. And elected, so it's elected and elected. Elected and elected. Um, I mean, I think that we, you know, again, I encourage all of us to, if we have the opportunity to find the ability to take the time away from work and go do that. Well, sir, sure work on it. Okay. I think we're ready for executive session. Right, How much time do we need? How about 8.30? 9.30. Yeah. What, Mountain? Can we make a motion to get the clock fixed before the next meeting? <clears throat> what do you, I don't, yes, we can. <laughs> I move to recess into an executive session for the purpose of discussing legal matters and to reconvene the regularly scheduled meeting in the city commission room at 9.30 p.m. Second. Got a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Aye to you, We're back from executive session and we need a little entertain a motion. I move that we go back into executive session and come back at 9.45. Second. Motion to second. Is that enough in that tab, or do we need to tell exactly what we're in there for? Okay. Got a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 3-0. Okay, we're back from executive session. Uh, is there any motions that anybody would like to make? I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn. Okay. Second. Got a motion, a second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you.